In my last video, I showed you the newest arrival to the Turbo Garage, my 1992 AutoZam AZ1. As you can imagine, purchasing a rare imported car like this can be risky and difficult. I can speak from experience as I did most of the legwork when importing my Nissan Figaro and it was quite the roller coaster ride. And not a fun roller coaster like this one here, for example. It was more like a ride on this. This time around, the friendly folks at Duncan Imports and Classics made the process simple and I can't recommend them enough. Check out their website for an online tour of their amazing eclectic collection and inventory of vehicles for sale. Or schedule a visit to see it all in person, which is worth the trip no matter where you're coming from. So after drooling over their warehouse of immaculate and rare cars right up until closing time, I got into my new to me AZ1 and made the four hour drive back to Knoxville. You know, the car says that it's exciting right here on the side, and let me tell you, that drive was pretty dang exciting. Especially with the giant SUVs getting extra close so they could get the perfect picture on their phone. Yikes! In spite of all that, I'm happy to report that the trip went well, and I even had time to pick up dinner for the family on the way home, which took up most of the interior space. <laughs> I first spotted the AZ1 in this July 1991 issue of Car and Driver magazine. This was the spy shots section, which was my favorite because you could get a glimpse of the top secret stuff that the auto manufacturers were working on. Keep in mind this is way before the internet, so this monthly trickle of information was like a waterfall to my young car loving brain. So even from this small photo and short description, my interest was piqued. A tiny gall winged sports car? I had so many questions. But the last line was always the killer in these articles. A US version is unlikely. So cruel. In my old magazines, the cars that always caught my eye were what Car and Driver called the unobtainables. I think the writers enjoyed tormenting quirky car lovers who pined over these rare beasts. Just look at the byline. No, you can't have one. Even so, the Japanese market cars from this era just spoke to me, with their combination of wild designs, high-tech engineering, and names like the Dangan ZZ, Skyline GTR, Bongo Wagon, Fair Lady, and S Cargo. They were unlike anything I could ever imagine driving through the streets of my small hometown. So after this spy shot glimpse, the AZ1 actually had a pretty good showing in the US. It appeared in all of the major US car magazines, like my old Auto Week here from December of 1992, was featured on my favorite old car review show, Motor Week, and even popped up at the 1993 New York Auto Show. I followed all of this coverage closely as a youngster, but just as quickly as the AZ1 appeared on the scene here in the US, it was gone and wasn't heard from again. Until the release of Gran Turismo 2 for the PlayStation in late 1999. This fueled my interest for the AZ1 all over again, along with many of the unobtainable cars that existed only in the Japanese market and also in my virtual PlayStation garage. Now, after a brief 27 year wait, I finally get to experience this tiny gullwing sports car firsthand, and I'd like to bring you along with me. This is gonna be fun. The AutoZam AZ1 was a mid-engined, two-seat K car produced from 1992 to 1995 as a joint effort between Mazda and Suzuki. As many of you probably know, K cars are a category of passenger cars, microvans, and pickup trucks that are designed to comply with Japanese tax and insurance regulations. In order to fit these regulations, the cars are restricted to a maximum physical size, engine displacement, and power. I find the K cars of this era interesting for many reasons, but especially love the quirky yet purpose-built designs. Okay, back to the AZ1. The name AutoZam was created as a part of a unique branding strategy for a line of Japanese market-only vehicles. These were mostly K cars and Mazda relied heavily on existing Suzuki vehicles. In fact, the early concept for what would become the AZ1 began at Suzuki, but was taken over by AutoZam after Suzuki abandoned that project in favor of the Suzuki Cappuccino Roadster, which is also a really awesome little car. The AZ1 first appeared at the 1989 Tokyo Motor Show as the AZ550 Sports, which was not one, but three concept car variations. The Type A, which most resembled the eventual production AZ1, the more conventional looking Type B, and the wild endurance racer styled Type C. After the show was over, the Type A was selected for production and the AZ1 was launched in late 1992. Okay, so let me take you on a tour of my AZ1. 
I wanted a clean, well-maintained, unmodified example, and the folks at Duncan Imports had exactly what I was looking for. Now these shots are after I gave it the full turbo garage treatment, so stay tuned, I'll be showing you all of that in a future video. It's no surprise that the first thing you notice about the AZ-1 is its diminutive size. When sitting alone with no frame of reference, it looks like a stubby but regular sized sports car. It's not until you get it next to other cars and trucks that its comically small footprint can be fully understood. I mean, this sucker is tiny, just 45 inches tall. We're just not used to seeing something like this on our filled out roads here in the US. The AZ-1 is comprised of a steel skeleton monocoque frame with all plastic outer panels. This type of construction allows for all sorts of possibilities, and as you can see, Japanese tuners and enthusiasts had a field day with this in the 90s. Once you get past the scale of it, you can start to appreciate the purposeful exterior details. The expansive glass greenhouse consumes the top half of the car. This car is equipped with what the brochure calls ticket windows, which is Japanese for mail slots. From there, it's a feast for the eyes. Large functional vents dominate the side profile, an offset and also functional hood scoop sits in between two giant eyeball looking headlights up front split by a nondescript AutoZam logo badge. These factory Enki 13 inch aluminum wheels wrapped in 155-65R13 tires fill out the wheel wells nicely. The rear follows suit with a heat extracting vented bumper and trunk lid and to finish things off circular taillights and a big old wing for maximum downforce. Upon closer inspection of the rear, it is dominated by the bright yellow Japanese K-Car vehicle registration plate. Hiding just under that is an AutoZam stamped muffler heat shield, and to the left of that is the stainless exhaust tip. But take a look just above that exhaust tip and you'll see one of this AZ-1's quirky yet distinct details. Some AZ-1 models were adorned all over with a wild optional graphics package. This one warns passers-by of the dreaded hot air exhaust while others describe what type of gas to use, where the air is being sucked in, how to open the door, and where to stick the key. Those are all great, but this one's my favorite by far. Midship DOHC Turbo Exciting Micro Coupe. It's like someone was tasked with describing the car in exactly six words, no more, no less. It's a pretty big visual element on the side of the car. You can easily see it from far away. I love it though, and it makes me smile every time I walk up to the door. I also love it because it really throws a curveball to people that try to figure out what this car is. You can see them mouthing the words with a very confused look on their face. D-O-H-C, exciting, what the? Since this is a mid-engine car, the space under the hood is dominated by the metal radiator cover, brake booster, AC components, windshield washer tank, and spare tire jack. Now, if you're wondering why the spare tire isn't up here, it actually lives inside the cabin. I know it looks like it should just go right there, but as you can see, there's no mount for it. Just a very perfectly made spare tire shaped indention. More on that later. The functional hood scoop I mentioned earlier doesn't feed the engine. It provides fresh air for the HVAC components. You can see the opening up near the windshield. Out back lives the drivetrain, which consists of a 660cc turbocharged and intercooled dual overhead cam three-cylinder engine paired to a close ratio five-speed manual transmission. At full song, this beast is cranking out the Japanese mandated maximum of 64 angry horsepower and 63 foot-pounds of torque. Peeking under the hood doesn't really show you much as the engine bay is dominated by the battery, cooling overflow tank, various intake bits, and the muffler here towards the back. So how do you work on this hidden little engine? <laughs> well, I'll show you that in a future video too. Last but not least are the gull wing doors. It's what blew people's minds about the AZ-1 back in 1992, and it still does so today. Mine came with the optional sunshades, which cooled the glass terrarium off nicely on hot sunny days. Okay, let's do something a little different here. Uh, it's story time. So, one day I stopped by the gas station to fill up the old AZ-1. Uh, it was early in the morning, so the usual crowd of confused folks that gather around whenever this car stops at any public place was non-existent. I topped off the tank, grabbed my receipt, and went in legs first, as uh, I instructed by the helpful YouTube video I had recently watched. 
and as I was slowly pulling away, a friendly car lover sort of appeared out of the early morning darkness. For some reason, my first instinct is to want to floor it in these situations and get out of there. But this friendly, albeit large, uh, um, unshaven fellow simply wanted to take a photo, uh, followed by a fist bump. Well, you see, uh, given my rate of speed, his trajectory, uh, the fact that I'd only had this car uh, for a couple days, and my mail slot of a window, I couldn't get the window down fast enough, uh, and I couldn't get my arm uh, in the right position, so I wasn't able to return his kind gesture. So uh, picture this. There he is, his meaty, hairy, tattooed fist hanging in the air, his face turning from joyful, childlike exuberance to murderous anger as I left him hanging in the cold, chilly air of the morning. Um, he didn't speak a word. His face said enough. It said, if I ever see you in your tiny car again, I will get that fist bump. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed story time. Okay, back to the video. Once you pop the doors, hydraulic struts pull them up and out of the way, revealing the sporty, two-seated, and surprisingly comfortable interior. The seats are lightweight, aggressively bolstered, and non-adjustable, but slide up and back a bit. Again, shockingly comfortable to sit in. Just beyond the sport steering wheel are the factory white face gauges, which are housed in a small motorcycle-like pod and are dominated by a large 11,000 RPM center-mounted tack. The interior is dressed in black, but is very well laid out and easy to use. The HVAC controls are vertically placed and live down here near your left leg. I made a few small changes in here that I'll show you in the next video, but overall it remains mostly stock down to the factory floor mats and the optional upgraded Carazaria AM FM cassette stereo. The previous owner in Japan added an HKS turbo timer, which is an excellent period correct modification in my opinion. Storage space is sparse. No glove box, no center console. You get one cubby to the right of the wheel, a vinyl pocket behind the seat, and some shelf space behind the passenger seat. Oh, and here's that spare tire I was telling you about earlier, right behind the driver. So there it is, a little history of the AZ-1 and a tour of my personal example that made its way from Japan all the way to the mountains of Tennessee. Thank you for watching, and in the next episode, I'll show you all the little jobs and detail work that I did to give my AZ-1 that extra level of turbo garage polish. After that, I'll take you for a ride and describe what it's like to own this weird little creature. So with that said, thanks again, folks, and we'll see you next time.